اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ سو ویلکم ٹو دس ویڈیو ام ان دس ویڈیو ور گوئنگ ٹو بی ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ ام ان انٹروڈکشن ٹو اللہ سو بیسیکلی اللہ ٹرانسلیٹس ٹو دا ڈیٹی اینڈ ام اف یو لوک ایٹ دی کمپیریزن اف عربک روٹس اف اللہ اینڈ ہیبرو روٹس اف الہیم Uh, because they're both Semitic languages, they have a common origin, a common source, a common family tree of languages going back. Um, they, the two names are very similar, and Hebrew rabbis or Jewish rabbis have acknowledged this. Um, if you look at um, the works of Maminides, I'm sorry if I'm saying that incorrectly, he clearly says that uh, The Muslim place of worship, a masjid, a place of prostration, is the only place of worship of a non-Jewish religion, which it's okay for a Jewish person to go worship at, because the perfect monotheism of Muslims, because of the perfect monotheism of Muslims, right? So this is a, a classical Jewish rabbinical opinion about praying and worshiping inside of a mosque, which obviously does not exist for a Christian church. The Christians might want to own Judaism as their original religion or the originating religion from which they sprung forth. But this is the opinion of classical Jewish rabbis within Uh, the classical rabbinical tradition. Anyways, so this series is meant to introduce Allah as the deity to a Western audience, but it's supposed it's meant to do that in a very precise, mathematically precise, a very rigorous manner, while still being relatable. So the Arabic language and Hebrew are based on trilateral roots, and the Quran is a complete, coherent. Uh, it's a it's a clear. coherent, complete, semiotic system um, in which the meaning can be determined. It is The meaning does not need to be interpreted. The meaning doesn't need to be constructed like the U.S. Constitution. It has to be determined and disclosed. Right? The meaning has to be determined, disclosed, discovered, deciphered. Right? It doesn't need to be constructed or interpreted right that isn't required for the quran it is a self-clarifying uh self coherent system of meaning right down to the trilateral roots that it used to construe that meaning so what what in the quran there's probably hundreds of thousands of roots that are utilized but what what happens is when you take a concordance of the quran and you gather every single uh every single use of a particular trilateral root, what you see, there's a very consistent usage of that trilateral root. There's a very consistent utilization to make meaning out of that trilateral root within the Quran itself, without referring to Hadith literature, without referring to classical jurisprudence, Islamic jurisprudence, but referring only to the Quran as a complete, coherent, meaning-making system in and of itself, we see that the trilateral roots are used very consistently. So the Quran has a very consistent uh, morpholo morphological utilization, very clear um, uh, terminology and phraseology. So right down to the very roots, it, the, the, everything that is utilized to make meaning in the Quran, every single unit of meaning is used very consistently and coherently within the Quran. Okay, so basically in the Quran, we have something called the Asma al-Husna. Now, everyone's heard of the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the 99 names of Sufism or whatever. This term, 99 names, originates in a hadith, in a narration, an authentic narration that has been authenticated through rigorous authentication process uh, by the Messenger of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? That is where the term originates. That is where you find the 99 names of Allah. But this term in the Quran is not found. 99 names of Allah in the Quran is not found. Rather, what is found instead is what's called Al-Asma Al-Husna, which means the most beautiful names. So the 99 names is the version of the term found in the Hadith. And then Al-Asma Al-Husna, the most beautiful names or the most good names, is what's found in the Qur'an itself. This term is used at least three or four times, as I, I, I recall. And what we're going to be doing is, in this series, we're going to go through and we're going to look at the usage 
uh, of these. We're going to be very precise, very analytical, very linguistically nuanced, and really go into appreciating what each one of these names mean. And it, establishing proofs and arguments for why this me why this name of Allah that is used in the Quran means this particular thing now not only is there's this categorical term for all the names of Allah that are found in the Quran like al asma al husna um, not only is that the categorical name but there's specific names aziz ul rahim aziz ul hakim aziz ul ghafur rahman ul rahim uh, rauf ul uh, rahim al ghafur ul wadud al wadud ul rahim right there's these these uh, double names found throughout the Quran right al aziz zul intikham al razak dhul quwwat al matin so th there's all these names of god that are found in the Quran and so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be determining the meanings of those names based upon very precise and rigorous appreciation of the Arabic language as it's used in the Quran, right? And our only source for establishing uh, vocabulary will be the Quran itself. So anything that we cannot establish from the Quran, I will not seek to include in this particular series of videos. So with that introduction to the series as a whole, Right. Let us move into the particular name we're going to be covering in this video, which is Al Aziz Ur Rahim, which means uh, the one who motivated by compassion, the one with uh, who, in order to accomplish a compassionate end, and who embodies the quality of compassion in his action, exercises might, exercises power, uh, exercises. Um, influence to attain that compassionate end but in the process there's a compassionate quality also so this is a name of god al-aziz or rahim aziz means the mighty rahim means the compassionate but when you have aziz or rahim it's actually the it means the compassionately mighty because in arabic it switches around so it's the compassionately mighty is kind of the translation of the term now we're going to look at why does it mean that? And how many times in the Quran does God say that? So basically this name of God is used in the Quran 11 times. Eight times it occurs in a verse which repeats itself every so often within the same chapter of the Quran. The same verse repeats itself as a rhetorical device. And it repeats itself until the last time this name is mentioned, the verse is different. So there's eight identical verses in which this name is mentioned. And then the last time the verse is different. Now this identical verse that, uh, and if you, you're interested, this is the 26th surah of the Quran. And it occurs for the first time in the ninth verse. And it's, وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ And indeed your Lord is the compassionately mighty. Indeed, your Lord is the compassionately mighty. Now, the second uh, verse in which this is used is basically what the Waqqul Ala al Aziz al Rahim, which means and rely upon, entrust yourself to the compassionately mighty, the compassionately mighty. So we see these two usages. Now, let's contextualize how it's used in the rhetorical structure of the whole chapter. So basically, the chapter has an introduction and an ending right it has an introduction and kind of like a final uh final chapter or whatever like a final ending to it right to wrap it up now it's used one it's in the introduction and the same way it's used uh seven more times throughout the surah throughout the chapter and then it's used once in the ending in that unique and distinct way right now the what the 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 content of the chapter is is basically god is talking about the prophetic cycle where he charges moses to go to pharaoh where he charges a messenger or a prophet to go to his people and to preach uh, to preach monotheism call toward god so there's a dialogue between god and the prophet where the charging occurs then there's a dialogue between the prophet and his people where he's communicating uh, back and forth with them there's a dialogue the majority always rejects the prophet whoever they ha tend to be it can be uh, uh it can be moses it can be Saleh, it can be all these various prophets right so whatever prophet it is it gets rejected then god saves the people the mominin the faithful he, he saves those who uh, believed in the prophet 
and he extracts them out from the people, from the majority of the people, and then he destroys the majority of the people because these are people who are doing injustice, they're committing wrong, they're cruel, uh, they're callous, they're immoral, they're unethical, they're unjust, they're tyrannical, and they they've been established proof on, like the founding fathers of America established proof upon King George before declaring independence, before disassociating, before breaking the bound the bonds that have once bound a people to another. Before doing that, there's a process of establishing proof. And the prophet has gone through that process with these people. And everyone who is going to believe, believes and is, is in a oppressed state because the unjust people who won't believe continue to oppress the people who do believe right so once that separation has happened when once the proof has been established that these people will not believe no matter what happens they're only going to continue to be unjust god actually separates the two people these people with the prophet the believers the faithful tend to migrate away and these people get destroyed right these people get destroyed uh because you know, they're not going to change and they're evil, right? So they get destroyed. And so in this process, in this prophetic cycle, which repeats with Moses, which repeats with Abraham, which repeats with almost every single prophet, uh, in this, there's a sign of God, right? In the destruction of the evil people, in the salvation of the good people, there's a sign of who God is, of God and who he is in his nature, right? There's a sign of God. Now, at the end of that, when when uh, all of that happens at the end, through every single cycle, God says, right? Indeed, your Lord is the compassionately mighty, the compassionately strong, right? So this is where the verse occurs. And this happens approximately seven times. One time in the introduction, we won't go into the introduction. And seven times um, if at the end of such cycles, the, at the end of such cycles, it happens seven times. Now, at the end, there's like an ending portion to the verse in which there is not a prophetic cycle being discussed, but rather uh, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to whom the Quran is being revealed, and the, the believers who are with this prophet, with this messenger, so kind of current. Uh, to us as Muslims, but also particularly to the Prophet at his time. So this is kind of the ending where the Prophet and the believers of his time are being addressed, but the structure is a little different. It doesn't follow the same cycle. And so during that ending address of the chapter of the Surah, um, the the verse that is recited is وَتَوَقُّلْ وَتَوَقُّلْ عَلَىٰ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ and rely upon, entrust yourself to the, the compassionately mighty, the Al Aziz al Rahim. Now, in other places, what Tawakkul Alilah, right, which means uh, uh, entrust yourself or rely upon the deity. Rely upon the deity or entrust yourself to the deity, Allah al Aziz al Rahim. Indeed, he, uh, it says Allah the deity, right? But here, it's, it's not saying to rely upon God in general or the deity in general. It's saying to rely upon the deity or God. In a particular in his, in a particular identity of his in a particular identity of God, which is equivalent, which is ultimately equivalent. This identity is ultimately equivalent with God, but but this identity because it it, it involves particular qualities, a particular a form of a particular uh, expression of God. So it's it's telling us to rely upon these qualities of God, which is and rely upon the compassionately mighty and rely upon the compassionately mighty. So what you have is in the whole kind of chapter, in the whole structure, what's being said is this is kind of what happened with the people before you, that this this kind of uh, fight between good and evil, between the unjust and the just, between the tyrannical and, and, the, and the equitable, right, between like the monotheist and the polytheist, this has been going on since since forever and the people who are hyper pragmatic or polytheistic or idolatrous or tyrannical uh, who control systems who tend to control systems these people always have a certain worldly power over the faithful right but the faithful you know they're supposed to use means and uh, kind of uh, to struggle with the best of means but uh, their ultimate reliance, they cannot compromise principle the way a hyper-pragmatic person or a godless person can, right? The way a godless person or what's um, 
a sophist, the way a sophist can, a, a faithful person can't do that. So the ultimate reliance of the faithful is upon divine intervention and it's upon upon the being of God, right? That is the ultimate reliance where we use the means in as far as we can to the best of our abilities, but our, we do not compromise principle the way uh, a sophist or prag, hyper-pragmatist can. And our ultimate reliance is on what tawakkul ala al aziz ur rahim And so before... When God is talking about history, when he's talking about divine history and the people who have passed before us, he's talking about, um, he's talking about, uh, that he is inna al azizur rahim that he is and indeed indeed your lord is the compassionately mighty but then at the end when he's directly addressing us the present muslims especially the muslims at the time of the prophet but us like the living uh, community the last revelation you know the people who are current the current religion he he commands us to do the same to rely upon this fact because the people before us the faithful who have proceeded before us have done the exact same thing so we're supposed to do the same thing they did in their time which is to reply rely on what tawakkul ala al aziz ur rahim rely upon and trust yourself to the aziz ur rahim now this this is the primary usage of this name in the quran but there's two other verses that are outside of this chapter outside of the surah this form is the literal translation of surah but to make it easier comparable to the bible I, i'm saying chapter but surah means form and so so when we we talk about quranic surahs we talk about, talk about quranic forms which is a composition of verses or composition of signs ayah means signs anyways so let's look at the the final two verses we're going to look at in this video allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says illa man rahimullahu innahu al azizur rahim except those who have faith uh, uh except those on whom um ar rahman has rahma uh, except those upon whom the deity has rahma or kindness or compassion so except those people upon whom god or the deity has kindness or compassion indeed he is the Aziz or Rahim, the compassionately, the compassionately mighty. He is the compassionately mighty. So this verse is basically it's saying that uh, it's you know when you have a particular verse or a particular sign of the Quran, you have to take it not only in its composition within the form, but you also have to take it as an individual verse. So when you take it within, if it has like a, this, uh, this begins with illa, so except so it's a. Uh, it's a dependent clause, so to speak, in English, right? It's a dependent clause. And in order to make it independent, you have to relate it to the verses that have preceded because it's accepting something. It's saying but or accept. So it's accepting a certain category of something from something else, right? So in order to see what that something else is, you have to look beyond the verse. But this is like a Quranic principle because each verse is actually a sign from God. There is an independent meaning. It is meaningful and to be contemplated on its own as an individual verse as well. So when God says illa, here what it means as an independent verse is regardless of what the particular thing that it's accepted, it's being accepted from, there is uh, all evil, all bad, all things that are not good, that are sufferable, that can all injustices and tyranny that could be on someone. Basically, anything bad that can happen, anything evil that. Can, God is accepting from that, right? He's accepting from that. So, illa man rahima Allahu, except those who uh, all, the deity Allah has rahma upon, which is kindness or compassion. He has kindness or compassion. Who al azizur rahim? He is the compassionately mighty. He is the compassionately mighty. So basically what it's saying is anyone who's accepted from any evil, who's who's taken out of any suffering or wrong or evil or bad, uh, any sort of suffering or wrong, right? Anyone who is accepted from anything of that sort, um, uh, it's, it is because the, the rahma of God or the, the kindness of the deity and he is the, uh, the, the compassionately mighty mighty and so if he does do this for someone where he does accept them both his compassion and his might are expressed in that accepting 
from evil or suffering, right? So that's the first verse uh, outside. Now lo let's look at the last verse we're going to look at, uh, the fourth verse, which is, uh, if you want to look at it, it's Surah 30, Ayah 5 of the Quran. And Allah says, Be nasrullahu yansuru man yasha wa huwal azizur rahim. So it's basically mentioning the help of, of the deity, the, the aid of the deity. Nusra is a big concept in Islam. It's like the help or aid of the deity. Be nasrullahi yansuru man yasha. Yansuru uh, man yasha'u, and uh, he he helps whom he wants. The deity helps whom he wants, right? Wa al azizur rahim, and he is the compassionately mighty, and he is the compassionately mighty. And so this compassionately might he is expressed when he helps someone. He helps whom he wants, and whom he wants to help is an expression. Of him being Azizur Rahim, right? He wants to help particular people because it would be an expression of his kindness and compassion to help those people, and in in helping them, that would be an expression of his might. So we're saying in in the help of God and in the fact that he wants to help particular people and in the identity of the people whom he wants to help, him being compassionately mighty is manifest and expressed. Okay, so this is the first name of God. So welcome to the introduction to Allah. We'll talk to you soon. Like, subscribe, and comment below any feedback you have. Goodbye.